After the huge success of the Apple II, which launched in 1977, Apple struggled to find another breakthrough for seven years. It came out with the Apple III, which had engineering flaws and had to be recalled. The next computer was the Apple Lisa, which cost $9,995, US making it way too expensive for the broader consumer market. Apple didn't deliver a strong follow-up until it released the Macintosh in 1984. By then, it was too late. Major competitors like IBM and Microsoft were also in the race for market control. Microsoft didn't have a hold of the hardware market, and its only weapon of defense was its software. So it started selling its operating system to other PC manufacturers and anyone who had a piece of hardware to run it. This strategy put them in the market as a major competitor. So if Apple was going to compete with IBM or Microsoft in the coming seasons or years ahead, they needed a CEO, someone who had the experience of running a multi-billion dollar corporation. The board settled for John Scully, who jobs famously lured to Apple from Pepsi by asking, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life or do you want to come with me and change the world? Scully took the job, and during the honeymoon period between Steve Jobs and John Scully, everything seemed to be going well. But it wasn't too long before the two started disagreeing on issues like how much the Mac should be priced, how the Mac would look and feel, and a lot of other decisions. When the Macintosh hit the market in 1984, it was a total flop, and Scully convinced the board to remove Jobs as the head of the Macintosh design team, which they agreed. Jobs tried to stage a comeback by confiding in senior members of his own team, which at the time included John Louis Gassi, who was being lined up to take over from Jobs on the Macintosh team. Gassi told Scully what was happening. Scully confronted Jobs in front of the board the next morning, asking if the rumors were true. Jobs said they were, and Scully once again asked the board to choose between the two of them, him or Jobs. Again, they sided with Scully, and Jobs' fate was sealed. Scully reorganized the company, installed Gassi as the head of the computer division, and made Steve Jobs Apple's chairman. That might sound like a plum job, indeed, a promotion, in, you know, but in reality, it was a largely ceremonial role that took the co-founder away from the day-to-day -day running of the company. In the following years to come, Apple saw a drastic drop in sales, the stock market got edgy, Apple shares lost a fifth of its value, and the company was nosediving into financial oblivion. In desperate attempts to find new designers and engineers that could create something revolutionary, in 1992, they found this young 25-year-old designer from Britain. His name was Jonathan Paul Johnny Ive. Initially, Ive refused to join Apple because he would have to move to America and leave his family back in England, but he later changed his mind. Ive studied design at the University of Northumbria at Newcastle and had his work displayed at the Design Museum. As one of his professors recalled, he designed some mobile phones that were slim and detailed, like modern phones, even while he was a school student. After graduating, he was hired by a startup design firm called Tangerine to work in their industrial group. In 1989, Ive was asked by a client to design a toilet, bidet, and a sink. The client rejected his designs because they were too expensive to produce. Where else could such a talent that had too much precision for luxury and futuristic design have thrived? Your guess is as good as mine. Apple. One of his first projects after joining the company was the Apple Newton, an early handheld computer that while innovative was bulky and too expensive to find mainstream audience. At a base price of $699, US which is about $1,500 today, the message pad was a pricey gadget at launch. It failed to find mainstream success. Ive takes failure seriously, so he almost quit Apple after the failure of the Newton pad. Then in 1996, Apple Computer by now struggling acquired Next, a company that Steve Jobs started after he left Apple, returning Jobs to the company he helped to create. And the following year, Jobs became Apple's CEO. In his reforms, Jobs fired many Apple employees and many in the design team. Jobs paid a visit to Apple's design studio, where Ive was only recently put in charge. He came over to the studio, I think essentially to fire me, I've recalled in Becoming Steve Jobs, a biography of the late Apple CEO. I've even had a resignation letter ready in his pocket. But you see, even if you buy the Lamborghini Veneno Roadster, a Bentley Continental GT, a Range Rover Vela, or if you're feeling adventurous, you shoot for a Bugatti Devo. Buying any of these supercars is not the problem. If you don't know how to put these cars to use on the road or on the racing tracks, then they'll remain nothing but just normal cars. The reason they cost so much is because of the potentials the cars have inside. That was Johnny Ive's situation when he arrived at Apple. He had all these potentials to make Apple products great again. But the then Apple management didn't know how to put these potentials to use. As Conan Doyle rightly noted in The Valley of Fear, mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself but talent instantly recognizes genius. Steve Jobs instantly recognized the genius in Johnny Ive once he met him for the first time. 
The two formed the close friendship and design partnership that took Apple from the brink of bankruptcy in the 90s and made it the first trillion dollar business in history. He became the senior vice president of industrial design in 1997 after the return of Jobs and subsequently headed the industrial design team responsible for most of the company's significant hardware products. Ive's first smash hit came later. The original candy colored iMac looked like nothing else on the market when it came out in 1998. It got lambasted for not having a floppy drive, making this the first time that Apple got rid of a feature that everybody else considered standard. Starting in 1999, the iMac would also give way to similar colorful iBook family of laptops, which looked funky but will later be replaced by the more rectangular MacBook. The Power Mac G4 Cube, another Ives design, wasn't quite the same sales sensation, but it reinforced Apple's reputation for making good-looking computers. The original iPod 2 was an Ives design. While music players had existed before, the slick sophistication of the iPod combined with its ease of use started a revolution and gave Apple the ground it needed to establish its now huge iTunes music store. The iPod was so successful it put competitors like the Sony Walkman out of the market. The Walkman was a household name, but it was too bulky to carry around. The iPod on the other hand was this tiny little object that could carry up to 1000 songs and yet it felt like a piece of candy in your pocket. Then in 2007, I've proved himself to be one of the greatest designers of our time with the design of the revolutionary iPhone which in my opinion was Ives' reinvention of the failed Newton pad. This design was so slick it sent competitors like Blackberry, Motorola, Nokia, Samsung and Sony back to the drawing board. Before the launch of the iPhone, using a touchscreen phone was hard labor. I remember my Sony Ericsson P1i. I loved the device, but using his touchscreen was tougher than you lifting a 300 kilogram truck off the ground. Then the first time I touched the iPhone, bro, I felt butterflies in my stomach. Like I had never seen anything like that. Any touchscreen that performs so precise like the iPhone as of the time. Johnny Ive helped create an entirely new category of mobile devices with the iPad, unveiled in 2010. The iPad was the first in the wave of tablets that had most of the functionality of a laptop and was slightly larger than the iPhone. I've also designed some of Apple's accessories like the Apple Pencil. The Pencil was unveiled in 2015 as a companion to the high-end iPad Pro. I've took a mobile computing design yet again with Apple's first wearable device, the Apple Watch in 2015. Now in its fifth generation, the Apple Watch supports a range of health technology, wellness monitoring and cellular data options. It was also rumored that I've convinced Steve Jobs to embrace white products starting with the unique white headphones that came with the original iPod which was a differentiating factor between the iPod and its competitors. Johnny Ive was also involved in the design of Apple's biggest project, its massive new headquarters and campus that was unveiled in 2017. Indeed, Ive has had his hands in just about everything Apple has come out with in the past decades, including the new Mac Pro unveiled at Apple's developer conference on June 3, 2019. Perhaps the biggest reason for his success was due to the close relationship and bond he shared with Steve Jobs. What Ive and Jobs shared was an obsession with detail. I've explained the close rapport that existed in his working relationship with Jobs in 2014. When we were looking at objects, what our eyes physically saw and what we came to perceive were exactly the same. And we will ask the same questions, have the same curiosity about things. Johnny Ive shared the same passion for art as Steve Jobs did. No one that Jobs once referred to him as his spiritual partner at Apple. I'm sure Steve Jobs would have wanted Ive to be CEO after him. Ive was given his own design office at Apple during the early 2000s in which he oversees the work of his appointed design team and he is the only Apple designer with a private office. Only core members of his team are allowed into his office as it contains all of the concepts including prototypes that the design team is working on. The offices of Steve Jobs and Ives in Apple's Cupertino headquarters were linked through a hidden built-in corridor with single glass access doors. It is rumored that Johnny Ive is the second most powerful person at Apple after Tim Cook. Ive has appeared on almost every major promotional video from the first iMac in 1999 to the iPads and iPhones and a host of other Apple products. But all that's about to change when Apple announced on the 27th of June 2019 that Johnny Ive will be leaving Apple to start his own design firm called Love From. What's surprising here is that Ive is the next favorite person to become Apple's CEO. Why is he leaving now? According to the Wall Street Journal report, internal sources claim Ive is leaving the company due to Cook's lack of enthusiasm for design, due to Cook's focus on business side of things. More so, Cook has filled up the board with more of businessmen and women other than techie folks. As a protege of Jobs during his detail-oriented visionary era, Ive was trained to create the magic of Apple's design, which sources claim has been lost during Cook's channel, which began in 2011. Steve Jobs was an innovator, a man that craved new designs and technology. He visited the design studio where Ive and his team worked regularly. 
he could easily connect with whatever projects they were working on and make changes where necessary. But that's not the case with Cook. He's a businessman and less of a techie like Jobs. And this actually annoys Ive who feels the company is losing direction and its value. Tim Cook has called this report absurd and claims none of it is true. But the other twist in this whole matter is this. Johnny is also a designer, a passionate beyond talented designer who outside of Apple hasn't been able to design much else in two decades. Remember before Apple, he designed clocks, chairs, toilets and a host of other things. But at Apple, all he does is gadgets and tech items. The genius in him still craves to get his hands on other projects like the good old days. That's why every once in a while he dabbles with other projects outside Cupertino. Like a recent collaboration with Mac Newton to create a diamond ring to be sold for $250,000. The two also designed a Leica camera and few other product red designs. In an official statement, Tim Cook made a shocking revelation. He said, Apple will continue to benefit from Johnny's talents by working directly with him on exclusive projects and through the ongoing work of the brilliant and passionate design team he has built. After so many years working closely together, I'm happy that our relationship continues to evolve and I look forward to working with Johnny long into the future. So what does this mean? Why would Johnny leave Apple only for his new company, Love From, to be hired by Apple before it even officially launches next year? This tells you that Johnny Ive is a high value asset for Apple. They still crave his input and expertise. Johnny Ive not only knows everything Apple has done up till now, he knows everything that the company is currently working on for the future. Johnny will still work with Apple but not as an employee but with Apple as a client which means Johnny is technically not leaving Apple. Apple has learned his lesson in the 80s when Steve Jobs was ousted as head of the design team and eventually from the company. Apple almost went into bankruptcy in the years that followed, but their revival happened when the same Jobs returned as CEO. They will not be willing to find out what they can do without Johnny Ive. Now check this out. In 2015, when Johnny Ive was promoted to chief design officer, he left the day-to-day -day running of the design team to Evans Hankey, who is the vice president of industrial design and Alan Dye, vice president of human interface design who have been announced to lead the design team after Ive's full exit. While Johnny focused on the design of the Apple Spaceship Campus that will um, house 12,000 Apple employees, boom, products started having issues. You remember the MacBook butterfly keyboards, right? Some of you probably own one and you might even be watching this video on the 2015 MacBook with a faulty butterfly keyboard. Customers started complaining and there have been no fix till now. Tim Cook had to restore Ive to the design team to fix things up. Not much is really changing. Nobody else at Apple will be taking Ive's title of Chief Design Officer and it seems clear that the brand will be leaning very heavily on Ive's new love from design company for the foreseeable future. Apple will be the new firm's first client and to stabilize things further, love from will even be based inside the Ive Design Apple Park. But what if Google or Samsung or Huawei or whatever competition hired love from and Johnny Ive? Nobody has an answer to that question right now. We'll just have to wait and see what the future has for us. Johnny Ive is the only one that represents the core values of Steve Jobs at the moment and it will be hard to let him go. But you know what? It will even be harder to watch you leave without hitting that subscribe button and clicking on the bell icon. Thank you so much for watching guys. I would like to know what your thought is about this topic alright. I'll see you again in the next one.